Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, Assistant Professor of Communication and Media at Lund University. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast, or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. In this episode, we're going to be diving into a pretty underexplored area of social media and politics research, and that is the role of political visuals. Things like images and videos, which if we open up our phones and check social media, we see that this type of visual content really predominates the platforms. And platforms over time have built their services to increasingly incorporate pictures, videos, live streams. But unfortunately, Due to some of the ways that scholars are trained and the methods that we have, we tend to focus on text and not so much visuals. So my guest today is Dr. Jenny Lindholm. She is a university teacher and researcher in political science, media, and communication at Oboe Academy University in Finland. And Dr. Lindholm has been doing some research on politicians' Instagram images and how they may influence how people who see them think about political leaders in terms of their traits, things like how compassionate are they, how warm or approachable or down to earth are politicians based on the images that they post on platforms like Instagram. And I think this type of research is really interesting and important because typically scholars look at what type of content politicians post, and they tend to measure the success of those posts based on the number of user engagement metrics that that post gets. So if a politician posts an attack and it gets a bunch of likes, then the inference is that this post must be successful. But it's not quite clear exactly what these engagement metrics represent. And it's also not quite clear whether politicians are just boosting certain posts, which would trick researchers into thinking that they are more effective when actually they're just being paid to be put in front of more people. So what's interesting about Dr. Lindholm's research in the first study we'll discuss in the episode is that her and her team used eye tracking to see where are participants looking at visuals on Instagram from two political party leaders in Finland, one who's male, one who's female, to see if there's a gender difference. And they varied whether the photos showed the politician in a public official capacity, kind of doing political work, or in a private, more personalized capacity, such as working out, to see whether where participants looked in the image and the gender of the politician, and whether it was in a public or private setting, might have an effect on how they rate the traits of that leader. So we'll break down that study and its design and its findings in the first part of the episode. It's called See Me Like Me, Exploring Viewers' Visual Attention to and Trade Perceptions of Party Leaders on Instagram, and it's published in the International Journal of Press Politics. There'll be a link to it down in the episode description if you want to check it out in more detail. Then we'll turn to focusing on another one of Dr. Lindholm's studies, which analyzes the emotion communication of the Finnish prime minister at various stages of the coronavirus coronavirus pandemic. So this is interesting because Dr. Lindholm used some of these emerging technologies around classifying emotions in film, or in this case, televised press conferences, to see whether there are different correlations between emotional communication and various phases of the crisis. So that's a cool example of trying to analyze emotions with new technologies in moving images or video, a really kind of experimental And something that I think is really important because not all visual communication is static images, right? So what is the role of emotions in how political leaders communicate crisis is the topic of that second study. It is in Swedish, but I will, and I will not (laughs) embarrass myself by trying my emerging Swedish pronunciation here on the podcast, but uh, I will put a link down to it in the episode description and can say that it translates well into English through Google Translate for any of those of you who are interested. But without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Jenny Lindholm. Again, she is a university teacher and researcher in political science science, media, and communication at Oboe Academy University in Finland. Dr. Lindholm, thanks for taking the time out. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you for having me. 
So before we dive into your research on Instagram images and emotions in crisis communication, why don't we start out with a bit of background into the political context of Finland. In both studies that we'll discuss here, you note how Finland is a country where the personalization of politics has been particularly strong, and party leaders now play a pivotal role in election campaigns. So can you describe a bit the modern Finnish party leader and their social media use? In terms of you know what you've seen, are they actively out there trying new things with digital? or are they mostly playing it safe and having a social media presence? Yeah, let's let's start there. So if we take a broad overview, when you look at what type of social media politicians in Finland use during the latest parliamentary election, the most popular sites were still Facebook or having your own web page. So when it comes to interaction and being innovative in the digital space, I would actually say it's the populist party, the Finns party that's one of the first to realize this potential of social media, and they have been using YouTube very, very well. So there are some examples, but if I get back to your question on party leaders, I have uh, mostly looked at Instagram myself, and I would say that the majority of pictures there are from their political life, and then a smaller percentage is showing their uh, personal or, or private life. So kind of playing it safe. But our uh, prime minister, Sanna Marin, she's also the, the party leader for the Social Democrats. She's been using Instagram stories quite a lot recently, which has gotten both some positive, but also some negative feedback and definitely has reached the news agenda. So I would say it's it's getting more and more intervened with everyday life. And it's kind of hard to separate these days. Interesting. Um, let's get into the first study that we'll discuss, which looks at how politicians' Instagram pictures affect their trait perceptions. And I think it's interesting because most studies of political campaigning, they tend to look at you know what politicians post, and then they measure the effect of those posts through these engagement metrics like uh, likes or reactions, shares, and those types of things. But in this study, you sought to test whether individuals evaluate the personalization strategies of politicians differently based on whether the politician was depicted in a public official capacity or a more private behind the scenes way. So before we kind of break that study down, can you outline the motivations for that study more broadly? Sure. So I would say that images and visuals are so important for communication and it's of course always been this way, but with social media, the visual communication is a prominent factor. And, uh, as a party leader, or also you and me as regular citizens, you can decide yourself what to post and what picture you kind of want to give of yourself. So it's no longer in the hands of gatekeeping journalists or restricted by, you know, short commercials. So politicians, they can control their message and uh, manage the public image of them. And we know that Images of a more personal and private character can reduce the distance between voters and their representatives. So you're offering this aura of proximity. And we also know that party leaders increasingly use different strategies to influence how others perceive their image. But I would say that we still have quite little knowledge on what happens to the viewer of this content. And both in terms of what is it actually that the person is looking at in the picture or in the visual communication? And does these different visual strategies have an effect on how the viewers evaluate the political leaders? So me and uh, two colleagues, Tom Carlson and Joachim Högweg, we wanted to study how the visual exposure and attention to photos of party leaders influence how you evaluate both professional and personal traits of the leaders. Right, which I think is interesting. It hasn't been done so much in this type of research. And um, you mentioned a bit that the the private setting brings users or viewers closer to the politician, this idea of proximity. Um, and, and you mentioned in the paper that there's been a lot of research on this public versus private distinction. So I'm wondering if you could describe you know, why you chose to focus on that specific aspect and why experiments would be a good way to research these effects. Yeah, I, I think there are so many interesting studies out there, but with a different outcome. So the focus has been on distinguishing between professional and private self-personalization. 
So either you're focusing on qualities connected to this official persona or you're displaying the ordinary human being behind the office. There's, for instance, a German study of politicians' Facebook posts that found that uh, expressing emotional and private self-personalization had a positive effect on audience engagement. And they measured it, like you, you said before, through likes, emojis, shares, comments. But actually, the most uh, common content in the posts was professional self-personalization. And this had no impact on the audience. And we also see other studies that kind of confirm this. We had a study on the Norwegian party leaders' Instagram posts, and their most uh, popular posts were portraying them as regular citizens, uh, skiing, longing for more snow, and so on. But on the other hand, there's uh, an experimental study from Singapore that showed that professional images had a more positive effect on voters' evaluation of fictive politicians. And we also, we know that seeing images and infographics, they can have a positive effect on how you evaluate the campaign. So because of these mixed results concerning the benefits of professional and private self-personalization, we wanted to study the causal relationship. And perhaps the best way of doing this is through experimental design. And I would say that although some of the previous research has found an effect of visual communication on how you evaluate the politicians, they do not tell us what specific visual elements the participants of the study viewed. So there are some studies using eye tracking, but still quite few in this particular field. Definitely. And I'm, I'm excited to get into that. We were talking about eye tracking in the, the last episode as well. Um, but I would also just mention that I think that it's it's interesting what experiments can do that maybe these user reaction studies don't do is that um, we still really don't know when politicians are boosting their posts. So we actually don't know whether the increase in likes is because users are actually liking them more or because politicians are just paying to put them in front of more people. So um, I'm a little bit skeptical of the, the user engagement metrics. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. But of course, there, there's many ways to look at, look at visuals. And I think maybe another kind of manipulation or aspect that's left out is the, uh, the role of gender, which is quite unique in the Finnish context. So how might gender play a role in assessing politicians' traits? And for this experiment, you chose politicians from two different genders. So could you describe that uh, thought process behind that? Yeah. So gender stereotypes, they can affect evaluation, such as women being seen as more nurturing and compassionate, while men are perceived as assertive and aggressive. And there's a lot of different research into this, but in the particular field that we were interested in, that is, if voters' trait evaluation vary depending on if it's a male or female party leader, uh, there's really not that much knowledge. There's a study of Twitter communication in the U.S. that found that self-personalization work better for male candidates. But there's also, again, an experimental study that found no differences on candidate evaluation based on male and female candidates' personalized tweets. So we, we need to know more in this particular question. And uh, we chose two party leaders in our study. Uh, the male was uh, Petteri Orpo. He's from the National Coalition Party. And then we had the female was anna Maja Henriksson. She's from the Swedish People's Party of Finland. And we were trying to get rather similar party leaders here. So these two have uh, several relevant similarities, such as they are both leading a middle right party. They are middle aged. Uh, both have a really cute dog that's often portrayed on Instagram. I think <laughs> that was important. Uh, and they are relatively new party leaders. And none of them is especially, you know, colorful or controversial. So they do not divide opinion. And this is what we were looking for. Yeah, I have a, a question about the dog, but I'll, but I'll ask it uh, next. But um, first, could you walk us through the design of the experiment itself? So who were the participants? What were they asked to do? And what type of stimuli did they actually seek? 
Yeah, so the participants in the study were 32 students at a university and they were divided into three different groups. So we had two groups that came to our lab and they watched photos of the party leaders and then they filled out a questionnaire. And then the third group didn't get any visual treatment, so they only filled out the questionnaire. So this was the control group. So when you came to the lab, you either get to watch private photos of both party leaders or public photos of the party leaders. And uh, the photos we chose were actual images that the party leaders had posted on Instagram. And we developed certain, you know, selection criteria to get as similar photos as possible. So, for instance, one private photo was a photo with the party leader with the dog. Uh, and one example of a public photo was campaign work in the field and so on. And while looking at these photos, we then used eye tracking to follow the test subject's visual attention. So what is it in the pictures that they focus their attention on? And um, the questionnaire then with trait evaluation asked about traits related to the political person. So kind of more competence, leadership and traits that are more associated with uh, the personal character, such as compassion or trustworthiness. Yeah, I was checking out the the supplementary material. And as you said, you really chose pictures that are quite similar across the two candidates. So like they would actually have their dog, but it, they would be very much posing in the same way. So the manipulation between the two is they're different people, but they're actually doing quite the same thing and posing the same way. Yeah, yeah, we were, we were really looking at all their their Instagram photos and trying to find these themes that we could see in in both party leaders' pictures. Yeah. And and as you were also saying before, um, that we don't know exactly kind of where these people are looking when they're looking at photos on their phone. And I thought what was cool about the study and something that you can really do with eye tracking is you divide the areas of interest or where the eye tracker will pick up where people are looking by the candidate's face, their body, and then also the background, if I have that right. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Interesting. So there's a lot to unpack with the the findings here. So I thought we could maybe take it in parts. Um, So you tested whether participants gave more visual attention to private versus public images. But then more specifically, you focused on where they looked in the image, whether it was the face, the body, or the rest of the image. And, And what were the key findings there? Yeah, so the first finding is that it was actually the professional images that captured the attention of the viewers, and this was true for both leaders. So they looked at these images for a longer time, and there were no differences within the treatment groups. So if you watched the private photos, you watched Orpo and Henriksson for a similar amount of time. Uh, But then to the question of what did they actually look at in the picture, And uh, as you said, we defined these three areas of interest. And the difference between the two treatment groups was that in the private photos, the test subjects, they spent more time looking at the face of the leader, while in the public photos, they looked at the surroundings and maybe who else is in this picture and uh, these kinds of stuff. And uh, there was also a difference in the time spent looking at the body of the female party leader. So in the private photos, her body got more attention than in the public photos. So even if the subjects paid equal amount of attention to the photos of the male and the female leader, independent of the visual setting, there were actually some gendered viewing patterns when you take a closer look at what it is in the images that the viewers focus on. Which is interesting, I think. I mean, and it's not just that you had only males in the study, right? So it's not that this is driven by just males looking at the body of the female leader. I suppose that there were also females doing this as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we checked so the groups weren't different and the gender wasn't something that varied across the groups. Interesting. Um, But then you also evaluated whether 
the images across the two candidates affected how participants evaluated them in terms of these key traits. So how did the public versus private photos affect leaders' trait perceptions? And what role did gender seem to play in those perceptions? Our expectations were that communicating professional activities convey an image of competence. But this was actually true only in one case for for the male leader, where it had a significantly high effect. But interestingly, the professional photos, they had a positive effect on impressions of uh, the personal character for both leaders. So the leaders were seen as more warm, nice, sympathetic, friendly when you had watched the, the professional images. And for the private photos, they did not impact competence rating, and this is as expected, but uh, they only enhanced uh, the ratings of a personal character for the female leader. So she was seen as more down-to-earth, sympathetic, and warm, but the same thing wasn't found for the male leader. Because hmm. I'm just thinking about it now. I wonder how... Um... You mentioned earlier that that neither of these politicians was particularly colorful or, you know, well known as some of the front runners. And I wonder if maybe that has something to do here because um like you mentioned for example that people tend to check out the background of an image to kind of see what's going on. Um do you think that might have some relationship to the fact that people don't know these politicians so well? Or that if they were a better known politician, maybe they would be looking at things differently. I'm not sure. I know it's an open question, but curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, uh, I would say that I think these two party leaders, they are still quite well known. We have kind of eight big parties in Finland. And uh, I would say that all the party leaders are displayed in media quite frequently and so on. But I, I think it's an interesting point you raised there. And it would be it would be interesting to do the study, but with maybe more controversial leaders. Yeah, because I'm just thinking what we were talking about last episode was that how when people uh, consume news on a smartphone, there's just not enough space compared to a computer to get these clues. And so I, I, I wonder how, um, how that factors in, because if people don't know the party leader so well, maybe they have to look at the background of the photo for more clues to make sense what's going on. Whereas if you see like Trump's face or Biden's face, you kind of already, you've seen it so many times. There's not so much to look at, I think. Yeah, yeah, that, that's totally an interesting point. Um, but you're, you're very explicit in the paper that this is kind of an exploratory pilot study. Um, and I think you're, you're right that it opens up a lot of interesting questions for future research. And so I'm curious to hear what you would think are, are good follow-up questions or what sparks some curiosity for you that should be followed up in future research like this. I think it's an interesting finding that professional self-personalization in visual social media appears to work better for male politicians than for female politicians. So also in a gender egalitarian political culture like the Finnish culture, where we know that political gender stereotypes have diminished over time, but we still see this here. So I think that's interesting. And I would also like to say that there is room for more eye tracking studies because they give us a new piece of the puzzle. And I, I think it shows in our study that we found no differences in how long you watch the photos, but there were differences when you actually looked at what it is in the pictures that the, the viewers looked at. And uh, these viewing patterns could be described as uh, paying attention to different aspects, depending on if it's a male or female politician. Uh, and perhaps this can also help us understand the results. I mean, if you watch the female politician's face a lot more, and then this affected that you thought it was a more compassionate person. So yeah, the, I think there are some interesting studies to be done there. Definitely. Because there's, there's so much we don't know about these images. And I mean, in, in this study, you have you have the public versus private, you have male versus female, and then you also have kind of where in the image 
people were looking. And I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts after conducting the study, how useful you thought the, the public and private distinction was. Because it seems that for most of the research out there on visual, there's some element of comparing the public versus the private. Sometimes it's called this like idealist campaigner frame versus the populist frame. And to me, that seems like it's only one way to analyze visuals, but it seems like the most popular way to research it now. And so I'm just curious if, if you think that is a distinction that we should keep going down or if there's other ways that we can slice these images as well. Yeah, I, I think it's it's hard to get away from the division, but I think we can develop it further, both based on, on this study and what I'm working on at the moment. So now I'm looking at how the Nordic prime ministers used Instagram for crisis communication during 2020. And I would say that we definitely see that the public versus private setting is very visible. And it's actually a big difference between the leaders in the Nordic countries, how much of their private life they show. But I, I also want to bring in a new player, and that is emotions. So if we're talking about the COVID crisis, the success of uh, Many female leaders, such as in New Zealand, Finland, Germany, Taiwan, has, I think, really started this gender-based leadership debate. And uh, differences in emotional communication styles have been brought forward as one significant divergence between male and female leaders during the pandemic. So previously, the key to success was kind of for leaders to perform masculine through nonverbal communication. But what COVID-19 has showed us is that female leaders did not adopt these male communication strategies. So instead, they presented this uh, new feminine leadership. So maybe you have to look deeper than just the private versus public sector and, and also look at what type of emotional communication there is. Super interesting. Yeah. I think that'll be fun to watch and an interesting kind of flip in, in this, uh, this idea of females kind of performing the male gender role, which I think has kind of been what the most of the literature so far has said. Yeah. So let's move into the second study I'd like to discuss, which is right about these topics, uh, about emotions and emotional communication from female politicians. So um, in this study, you looked at the Finnish prime minister's emotion expressions during crisis communication around the coronavirus. And so here you're looking at visuals in a very public setting, but focusing specifically on emotions. Can you describe for us why emotions are a key aspect of visual political communication, particularly during a crisis? Uh, I would say that the need for information increases drastically during times of crisis because uncertainty dominates everyday life. And uh, this is why leader communication becomes specifically important during crisis, because we have this climate of fear and anxiety that directs citizens' attention to the situation, and then they look for motivational cues from the leaders. And these crisis situations, they are characterized by decision makers having to react quickly and uh, making decisions under very uncertain conditions. So uh, during COVID, but also this ongoing situation in Ukraine, uh, live press conferences are used quite often and they are followed in, in real time by both journalists and citizens. And this places high demands on the political actors in how they behave and that they use a reassuring manner so their behavior can actually make the situation better or worse. And uh, experimental studies show that citizens who watch this type of traumatic content, they can easily distinguish between crisis communication that is secure and convincing and, on the other hand, crisis communication that is uncertain and uh, perceived as less reassuring. And uh, moreover, what I think is really interesting is that emotional reactions to this type of media output can also translate into lasting political attitudes. Hmm. Yeah. And it, I, I know from um, 
both what you wrote in the paper, but also the kind of general crisis communication literature is that scholars tend to view crisis as happening in distinct phases, right? There's like different parts of the crisis as it unfolds. So could you introduce the specific case you were looking at in this study and how it could be broken down into various crisis phases? Yeah. So in this study, me and Joachim Hegweg, we looked at the Finnish COVID management and especially we investigated the press conferences that were held during spring and summer of uh, 2020. So research in crisis management and crisis communication usually divide the crisis into different phases because there are different goals and different strategies that the actors use depending on where in a crisis situation you are at. So I think what is special about COVID is how it's a very long-lived crisis. But in Finland during the spring of 2020, we, we first see the warning phase. And this is where the, the threat is imminent and warnings start to be given out. And this is then followed by a more acute phase where the society is actively trying to avoid danger and uh, reduce harmful effects by implementing different types of restrictions in society. But then, at least in Finland, when we approach summer of 2020, we start to enter what could be seen as like this first recovery phase where uh, some societal functions are re-established. And we were then especially interested in leader communication and we analyzed uh, the prime minister, Sanna Marin's facial expressions during these uh, press conferences, during the different phases. Right, which is interesting because these are not just, you know, static images like on Instagram. You have these moving images of the press conferences through uh, through television or, or social media, whatever it happens to be. So um, what aspects of these emotions were you kind of seeking to test and how did you actually go about classifying them in these moving television images? Yeah, we were interested in the nonverbal crisis communication and especially then the emotional expressions during the press conferences. And we used uh, a software based on machine learning that is trying to identify different types of facial expressions. So the program, it starts by identifying a face and then uses face modeling based on neural networks. So it identifies over 400 key points in, in the face. And um, then this research is kind of based on the facial action coding system developed back in the 1970s. So the program identifies action units such as your nose, your eyes, different facial muscles. So you can have like raised eyebrows or wrinkling the forehead. And then these action units are combined to represent different facial expressions such as joy or anger or sadness. And the program is, is trained by artificial neural networks to, to recognize these patterns. Mm -hmm. And so you applied this software to eight separate press conferences. And what I found was interesting is that you have some pretty stable findings about emotions, but then also some that differed based on the, the press conference. So overall, what were the main emotions communicated and how might they have changed as the COVID pandemic unfolded? Uh, Sanna Marin's nonverbal communication can be seen as very calm and reassuring throughout uh, all these three phases. And actually, there were quite a lot of expressions of joy. And this should maybe not be interpreted as her being happy about the situation, but as she's more like showing a willingness to cooperate and trying to get the Finnish people to, to work together during this crisis. Uh, there are also expressions of anger, especially during the, the acute phase when, when all the restrictions are implemented, which can be linked to dominance, according to the theory. And uh, previous research on effective leadership communication highlight that dominance and uh, the use of bonding expressions, such as smiling and so on, can be very effective. And um, I would say not surprisingly, you see that she uses stronger emotional expressions as we enter the more acute phase. 
but still also displays a calm and confident communication style. But the really interesting outlier is uh, the press conference that is held for young children. And here we see the use of totally different types of expressions, such as sadness and uh, fear. And these were not present during as much during the other press conferences. So here she is uh, definitely showing a more vulnerable side, which probably also reflects uh, the experiences of uh, the children during this crisis. Yeah, which is so interesting. A press conference aimed at children. I don't know how many countries uh, have those going on. But I have to ask, this is a bit of a, an odd question maybe, but um, thinking about emotion expressions, um, I mean, coming from the American context, that's so kind of theatrical and, and you know, kind of crazy, honestly, with some of the advertisements that are out there. Um, I do wonder about the specifics of Finland, because there's kind of a stereotype that Finns are known for not being very emotional. Um, I think you could also maybe put the same for, for Germany, where politicians, I would guess, are a little bit more serious than in the American context. So I wonder how you think that may or may not have played a role in your study in terms of how animated Finnish politicians are, or perhaps do you think political leaders are expected to maybe break these stereotypes and show more emotions? I think it's a really interesting question and I do not know the answer, but in this new study I was talking about before, uh, when we look at all the Nordic uh, prime ministers, maybe we'll get more an answer out there. But I would also say that it, it probably depends on how you measure the emotional displays or like the emotions because we have studies looking at gestures and body language or you can look at uh, verbal content how emotional you are there so i think there are are many ways to express emotions and one reason that i find facial expressions so interesting is that maybe they to some extent are more unconscious for instance facial expressions uh, they are shown to be a better predictor of the valence response after a presidential debate than the candidates' like actual verbal strategies or policy stances. So I, th I think there is something human to this. Uh, to this also, but I, I'm I'm really curious to to learn more. And I I think of course the the cultural expressions are are also an important part. Of the puzzle. Yeah. And like you were saying with this, um, that joy might not be so much happiness as it is like signaling approachability or being open to cooperation. It's kind of like this primate communication at a fundamental level, like, like chimpanzees do or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is quite interesting. Um, but I'm curious to get your take on these automated uh, emotion classification tools. Um, and I'm sure some of our academic listeners are curious as well. Because So um, based on your experience with this Effectiva software, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of automated emotion coding? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to think about here for sure. And I would say that a big challenge if if you use images or videos that you don't produce yourself, is that you can't really control the environment. So not all emotional expressions can be captured. So if, for instance, in my study, if, uh, if the prime minister looks away or she looks down or why not in some other circumstances, the lightning might be bad. So you can't really see the face. Uh, so to get a really good result, you have to think about what you put into the technology, what you actually can get out data-wise. But I would still say that compared to doing manual coding of facial expressions, which was actually done before, this technology is, of course, time efficient and provides so many opportunities. Um, it is maybe the same problem as with other types of biometric or psychophysiological data that you get, you get an overload of data. So what does all this data mean? And uh, perhaps it is also relevant to look at, at the intentions of the sender uh, and also then 
like we did in the first study, the effects on the viewers or the recipient. So I think it would be interesting to see, like, do we mimic the facial expressions of our leaders, especially if we like them? Because this is what we do in, in real life. Hmm. Interesting. And also getting to this connection between politicians and the, the citizens in terms of these, not just trade perceptions, but I guess also mimicking them is kind of an interesting uh, question for sure. Um, but my last question for you here has to kind of, you know, thinking about the two studies together, in the first study, you're looking at campaigning politicians. And then in the second study, you're looking at the prime minister kind of in their official capacity. And I know it's a bit speculative, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how this visual communication might differ between campaigning politicians and those who are already in office. Because on the one hand, the prime minister is, you know, the prime minister. They are the public, you know, face of the government to some extent. But then also in a crisis, they might be more in a campaigning mode against the enemy of the crisis, if, if, if that makes sense. So kind of perhaps the prime minister goes into an opposition mode in this crisis communication. So I'm curious to get your thoughts, whether you think the visual communication of politicians would differ in a campaigning context versus their public office context. Yeah, I think, first of all, you can, you can never really like leave out the emotions from the big picture, no matter if we're talking about campaigns or, or crisis communication and um, visual and, and nonverbal communication is an important, is a really important part of how we communicate with each other. So in the first study that we talked about, the, the test subjects looked at the face of the political leader and we are drawn to faces. We, we recognize faces. We look for faces in uh, Images. So when we talk about the, the competence of a politician or we evaluate the, the crisis communication, it's, it's not all about what is done or what is said or what recommendations or restrictions you give out. It's also about how you look when you say it or, um, yeah, how, how you look in the campaign posters or in your social media material, because this affects the evaluation of uh, of the situation and and of the party leader so maybe that's my conclusions <laughs> interesting i mean there there's so much we don't know about these visuals and an emotional communication particularly on social media but uh, i know this is an up and coming area of research so dr linholm thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your research with us thank you it was really nice talking to you about these issues I've just been speaking with Dr. Jenny Lindholm, university teacher and researcher in political science, media, and communication at Oboe Academy University. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Coming up on the show, we'll have an episode on anti-Semitism and social media in the near future. And yeah, we'll see what the spring has in store. If you have any ideas for episodes you'd like me to cover, you can tweet me at SMNP Podcast. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Melba. See you next time.